Hi, thank you so much for uh, clicking on the Louis file. We're in the midst of uh, uh, study through the letter of Hebrews and we're in chapter 3. Today we're going to be starting around verse 7, Hebrews 3, 7. Uh, just as a quick reminder, I, I would really ask you to go find the uh, videos that came before this. I think they're marked clear enough. If you just uh, search Hebrews 3, 1 through 6, you'll probably pop, pull up 2, because I did 2 on those first 6 verses. So today we're going to continue into 7. In the last video, just by way of reminder, we talked about the servant or son and how if you're a servant, that's all fine and good, but a servant doesn't inherit things from the father, only a son does, which is why it's important to think of uh, the idea of us being born of God, born of His Spirit, because then we can take by faith the promises of God as our Father, because the Spirit within us is crying out, Abba, Father. And uh, we do serve God in a sense, but we serve Him now in the, in the, in the way of a son, in the way of someone that is going to inherit something from our Father, not just our boss, but our Father. All right, so today <clears throat> I want to pick up in Hebrews 3, starting in verse 7. Uh, I'm going to read the first, let's see, Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. We're probably going to stop, look at that for a moment, and then we'll move on. So this is a, a quote from the Old Testament. So Hebrews 3, 7 says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for forty years. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So God is saying, I spent 40 years working with these folks in the desert, and they tested me on every turn. <laughs> Hard-headed, and they always went astray in their heart. And it says, And they did not know my ways. So you know, God brought Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, and He was forming and shaping and turning and molding them into a nation of His people to inherit, to receive the, the promised land that he, he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which became the nation of Israel. So He gave them a, a lot of rules, laws, regulations, and uh, rituals, and uh, all kinds of things to try and I think there's a couple reasons, mainly because they, they'd never been a nation, so they didn't know how to get along with one another uh, outside of their Egyptian slave masters whipping and forcing them. So God was trying to shape their minds and get them to know Him and His ways through this wilderness journey, uh, and it didn't seem to work for most of them, 40 years and Joshua and Caleb are the only original two that actually enter into this promise uh, out of several million, most people think, that died in the wilderness. Um, so, so we see that God's purpose uh, through this journey from Egypt to the promised land was to fulfill a promise, but it was also to uh, work Egypt and the slave mind, if you will, out of these people so that they would know and grow up and learn how to take care of what God gave them. You know, to inherit something means that you become responsible for it. And uh, so God's not going to give uh, the flesh-minded, the carnal-minded, the, the uh, childish one something that only an adult can handle. So he, he, he was using that opportunity to grow them up. Let me show you a verse here in Psalm 103. It sort of illustrates this with one verse in a way. Psalm 103, verse 7, says this. He, talking about God, He made known His ways to Moses, His acts or His deeds to the sons of Israel. So if you look back in Hebrews 3, verse 10, it says, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts and they did not know my ways so Israel, the, the common person from, is, from the bondage in, in Egypt, you know, we have Moses, but then you have the people that were following after him, the everyday guy and girl. 
saw miraculous uh, events. Uh, they crossed the Red Sea on dry land. Uh, some of Israel's enemies were thwarted without them having to lift a finger. God fed them miraculously every day, brought water from a rock, uh, had a cloud over them so they didn't get too hot during the day, had a fire so they could stay warm at night. I mean, just all these miraculous deeds or acts that God revealed to the children of Israel. But even though they saw all those things, they never came to know God's ways. They never really came to know God through these things. If they had, then they would have believed him and went on in to the promise. But they didn't. Uh, I think there's a lot of people like that in our day now uh, that need, want God to bless them, provide a way, make a way, show me how, give me what I need, uh, but they're oblivious or blind to the things going on in their life and that God is doing something. His, his way of getting you into a place to receive what he has for you and to get to know who he is. Uh, so, we talk, I talked about this in the last video, but so God, so Jesus told his disciples back in John 15, he said, uh, I no longer call you servants or slaves, but I call you friends because I've revealed everything to you that the Father has shown me. And, and he's not going to show all that to just a mere slave or servant. So if you look in Hebrews 3.10 again, it says, Therefore I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. So Jesus is revealing in John 15 his ways to the disciples, at least to the point that they can take it. So now in Hebrews 3, we see that same kind of thing again. And God saying, you know, I was upset with those people because they never came to know me and my ways and who I am and what I'm about. They just wanted me to, to provide for them and, make, and comfort them and make them feel better. And, and they were always whining and complaining. So in Hebrews 3.11, he says, I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They're not going to enter in. because So what I've come to realize is that in, in order to enter God's rest, you have to, or to know God's rest, you have to know God's ways. Because the world is going to swirl and test you and tempt you and try you and bang up against you all day, every day. But if you know God's ways, then you can be at rest even in the midst of all that. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 27, he said, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. Uh, and he's saying that I, I have a peace, and you could say peace and rest, I think, that you can have on the inside of you, even in the midst of the swirl. See, the world thinks that peace only comes when all the weapons are down, and everyone's singing kumbaya or something around the fire. Jesus knows that's unrealistic, but he also knows that he can... He can bring an inner man peace, a peace in your spirit, a place of a, a, a rest and a peace inside there, even during the difficulties. And that's part of God's ways. He has a way of getting us through by keeping us at rest on the inside, even during all the challenges on the outside. All right, so this led me. Now, I'm not saying this is a quote from this particular passage, but if you will, go back with me into the Old Testament, into Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I couldn't figure out a way to do this other than just read the whole chapter. So I'm probably going to read this whole chapter, spend a little time here, and if we have to, we'll just end the video in Deuteronomy 8, but I think you'll see why I'm doing this in just a moment. So this is, a, this is God's dealings with Israel, and he's telling them, Moses is what we say wrote this. So he, he's, he's speaking to Moses, through Moses, to the children of Israel. And, he's, and God's really explaining himself as to why things went the way they go or the way they went. And, uh, and it's, it's quite remarkable to me. And then we're going to take that idea and we're going to move it over for us, the new covenant believer in Christ. We're going to go from a physical, literal desert and a physical, literal promised land that you can point to on a globe but in Hebrews, what he's doing, is, it, it, the writer is bringing us with this idea, getting us to know God and his ways, and then showing or transferring it over into the Spirit. So in chapter Hebrews 3 and into 4, what we're going to start seeing is the new covenant believer has an offer of rest in our spirit. And that the only people that enjoy that are the ones that simply believe God, trust God. And the ones that don't have or don't rest 
in their inner man are just like the children of Israel who died in the desert and never enjoyed what God had offered them. So let's just read Deuteronomy 8, starting in verse 1. It says, All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. So this is right before uh, the, uh, the story about Israel crossing the Jordan to literally go into the promised land. Uh, Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you. Aha. Uh -huh. Testing you to know what was in your heart. Oh, look at that. Back in Hebrews 3, it says that they always go astray in their heart and didn't know my ways. So now we're getting somewhere. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and led you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you, just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Aha. Now, what he's saying is, is God has given you instruction, commandments, uh, laws, ordinances that you have to live by. And, and, it, and, it, and it deals with your heart and mind and attitude toward God and your heart and mind and attitude toward your neighbor. We go through a whole bunch of laws about, you know, if... If your oxen stomps on my calf or my, my lamb or my donkey, then you owe me one in return. It's just civil law. It's just treating your neighbor as you want to be treated. So there are these things that a nation needs laws and, and uh, rules. All right, so I don't want to get too sidetracked here. Deuteronomy 8, 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Mm. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out of the rock of flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise you may say in your heart, My power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, and that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. It shall come about, if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish because you would not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Wow, so Israel is God's special people, but in this sense, he's not giving them special favor. <laughs> if, they, if they run astray, then they get disciplined too. Amazing. All right, so God's ways with Israel in the wilderness was to prepare them for the promised land. They were slave-minded, immature, whiny people. So they had to grow up. And how do we grow up? Well, we tend to grow up through hardship and overcoming things. Uh, suffering is what leads to glory. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing in the New Covenant. It's like when you become a a believer, you're like a babe in Christ, and you still have a whole lot of fleshy-mindedness that goes on, and you still have self-centered things happening. So you have to have challenges, and you have to be brought through things, not to make, not necessarily for suffering, just for suffering's sake, but for, for you to come to realize you can trust Christ who is now within you 
to direct your path. You get to know the one. They got to know the one that was leading them. There, it was outside of them. He was, you know, leading them from afar by way of Moses. But the plan in the new covenant is, is that Christ is going to take up residence within the believer, and now He's going to direct us from within. But we still have to have our thoughts and our minds renewed. We still have to start to learn and discover who God is and come to know His ways in order to walk in the promise. So if you notice, there's a, he tells them clearly that there was a method, there's a reason for him leading them the way he did. Look back in Deuteronomy 8, 2. He said, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness for these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So God's, he's the landlord of this land, and he... He wants the descendants of Abram, Abraham to have it. He's, he's promised it to them. But if they're just going to go in there and wreck the place, he's not letting them have it. They're not, if they're not mature enough, if they're not humble enough to trust him and to be respectful of him and, and, and the idea that it was a gift and they didn't earn it, that's what he says. He says, after all this great stuff starts happening and all your, your flocks and your food and your money and everything starts to multiply, you're going to start getting all puffed up thinking you did it in your own power and your own strength. And you're going to forget that this is a gift. You're going to forget that this is God Almighty Himself who is making this happen. And we can't have that. So we, we have things that knock us off our pedestal from time to time. So back in Hebrews 3, God is uh, he's saying, look, just like those people there in the Old Covenant story made me so angry, I swore they would never enter my rest. Now if you look in Hebrews 3 verse 12, he says, Take care, brethren, that there not be any in any one of you, dear reader of Hebrews, that's now partaking of this new covenant, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. See, we're in the same danger. The covenant is shifted, and it's, it's, we don't have a promise of physical, geographical property in, in the same manner that Israel did, but we have the promise of an inner spirit property and rest and peace in our inner man. Verse 13, Hebrews 3.13, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ... If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Hmm. So notice verse 14. It says, We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm till the end. So we have an assurance that this rest and all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. We have that assurance. And, and when we really have that assurance, we will hold on to the completion. Or better yet, He'll keep us, but, but we will stand on those promises and we will trust Him till the end. That'll be the proof that we really are a partaker of Christ. Wow, because He has a way of making us stand. Hebrews 3.16, For who provoked Him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So they were set free from slavery in Egypt. Now, you could say, you can make a picture here that Pharaoh would represent Satan. Egypt is like the world and the world system. So God, through Moses, pulled them out. He rescued them from the domain of darkness. And he was transferring them over into his son, right? Through this wilderness, into this promised rest. Now, some people, uh, you know, in hymns and in teaching, will equate the promised land to be like heaven for us, like an analogy of heaven. Uh, well, if that's the case, then Moses didn't make it and none of the children of Israel made it. Uh, I just don't think that's exactly what that's a picture of. Now, there may be instances where you can say that, but I think the promised land of rest is a picture of what God's plan is for the believer that lives by Him, trusts Him, and uh, walks in Him to walk in the Spirit and to enjoy all of what the promise entails. 
um, I think it's more, more reasonable that it would be a uh, life in the spirit uh, by the believers. The believer's life in the spirit is the, is the life of rest, the life that he's promised us. So these folks got rescued, got brought out of Egypt and away from Pharaoh. The slavery was broken, but they never really enjoyed life in the spirit. They never really enjoyed getting to know who God really is in his ways and walking in this peace and this rest that he offered them. They never really got to appreciate it. And I'm afraid there's a lot of folks like that. Uh, that's why I don't think it's a good picture. It's not a picture of heaven. I think a lot of Christians have been set free, but they've just never been taught or they've never had enough curiosity. I don't know what's happened there to discover God, who God is and his ways and to, and to walk in his spirit. So they miss out. They don't get to... They don't get to enjoy the fullness of the promise that, that, the, that some others do. So if you look in Hebrews 3, he said in verse 18 and 19 that God swore that they would not enter his rest and that they were disobedient. And then in verse 19 says that disobedience is equivalent to unbelief. So the disobedience that it's saying here is that they weren't allowed to enter into the rest because of disobedience. And what is he saying? They were not allowed to enter into the rest because of unbelief. Oh my gosh. So the offer of rest is just right there on the table, just like it is for you or I. And all we have to do is, by faith, take this thing, take this promise of rest. But if you walk around not believing, either not thinking it's available or it's not real or just that it's not for me, then you will be in unbelief and you will never enter. It's, it's interesting, <clears throat> when you look back at the story, when Israel got right up to the promised land, what they, they, they were told it was theirs, and then they picked 12 spies to go into the land, check it out, and come back with a report. And I'm pretty sure the scripture nowhere tells us that God himself ordained that meeting and that, that, uh, that committee, if you will. They came up with that on their own. God said, go in and take it because it's yours. They said, let's, let's get a group of people to go in and see if we can take it. See, there was already seeds being sown of unbelief and doubt. So when they came back with the report, there are giants there, big giant grapes, all this. The, the, it's just amazing. We're, but we're like grasshoppers. Ten of them started to figure out a way to go back to Egypt. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go in. And they got outvoted. So they got to wander around in the desert with a bunch of unbelievers, even while they believed and they wanted in. And they did. They did finally get to enter in as old men. Wow. So disobedience in this sense, unbelief is disobedience. And in fact, if you look at the Hebrews letter, I'm pretty sure that that's the only real uh, sin that's addressed I mean, really addressed here. I mean, at, at the root of it all, unbelief is the one sin that produces lies, thefts, murders, adulteries, all these other things. Unbelief is the, is the root cause of that. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. All right, so in the next video, we're going to move into chapter 4, and, it, and he's going to start to now move us, the new covenant believer, and he's going to he's going to give this he's going to use this analogy that we just went through or this story in the Old Testament. And he's going to use that as a picture as to how this affects the new covenant believer. So we're going to go from a physical promised land uh, on on a map on a phys geograph geographical location we know of as Israel and we can point at today. We're going to go from that and we're going to transfer this whole idea over to a spirit rest. Uh, for the new covenant believer. Mind-blowing, uh, freeing revelation is coming your way if you haven't ever looked at this that close. So I, I would encourage you to, to tune back in to see what we're going to look at in Hebrews 4 in the next Louis file. Thank you for your time. I'll see you then.